So I'm about to scan a 1992 uh, Chevy Suburban or GMC Suburban for a hard start on uh, poor idle quality when cold. There's not much data available but we have to use this OBD1 adapter and with the snap-on scan tool this DA5 adapter to convert it to a 16 pin and then because there's no power at the DLC we have to use this uh, uh, cigarette lighter adapter so we'll get set up and we'll look at engine data parameters when it's uh, cold to see if the temp sensor and map sensor are reading realistically so this truck is remarkably clean it's got 490,000 kilometers on it uh, I believe the engine has been replaced once but uh, we'll have a we've got the scan tool set up here powered up we're gonna connect to it obviously it won't auto ID and we'll uh, see what the data parameters look like. Well, the good old days, there wasn't very much to choose from, really. Anti-lock brakes and uh, PCM. Well, we're going to go into the PCM, and it's under 8600 GVW, and it's an automatic transmission. And I've already got the connector plugged in because I knew which one I needed. Turn off the heater fan here and the radio. Let's see if there's any codes in it to start with. No codes. Well, let's have a look at the data list in all of its glory. Probably about 30 data parameters. Yeah. Okay, coolant temperature is 8 Celsius, which looks realistic. It didn't have intake air temperature, so I got nothing else to compare it to, but that's approximately the temperature outside today. It's sitting in the sun, so it's a little warmer. Uh, map reading 4.8 volts, which is realistic. 29.5 inches of mercury. Okay, well, let's see how it starts. Actually started pretty darn good. It's got a bit of a piston knock in it, which went away. Oh, I felt it stumble there a couple times. It's got an ignition misfire. Yeah, it's got an ignition misfire. It's got a spark plug wire leaking or distributor cap rotor problem. Now it's cleared out, but it had an ignition misfire there. This will take forever to go into closed loop because I don't believe this even has a heated oxygen sensor. There's the O2 sensor reading saying or loop status is open loop. Well, we'll get it in the shop and we'll have a look at secondary ignition. Here's a look at the data list that was available back in the early 90s. It was actually pretty impressive for its time, but by today's standards it's pretty archaic. Some interesting data parameters in here to note. Integrator and block learn. That's GM's early way of identifying short term for integrator and long term for block learn fuel trim. Now it was displayed as a number from 0 to 255. 128 is equivalent to no fuel correction, so it would be the same as 0%. Numbers above 128 would be positive fuel trim corrections, and numbers below 128 would be negative fuel trim corrections. In uh, 1995, I guess 96, when OBD2 legislation took effect, uh, the GM techs had to learn the short-term and long-term field trim. They, GM actually kept this integrator and block learn in their uh, data list for a few more years, and then they changed over to the new terminology, short-term and long-term field trim, and had a display as a percentage. So it ran in the shop here. It feels like it has an ignition breakdown, ignition misfire. It might have a leaky spark plug wire or 
distributor cap might be corroded inside. Another problem on those engines was the uh, the grounds by the thermostat housing. I'm going to clean those up, make sure those are good, and uh, the pickup coil connections on inside the distributor cap became oxidized and corroded. We're going to have a look inside there. Uh, let's look at some other data here. That's the entire data list right there. Um, AC request no park neutral switch. It, it uh, just wanted to know whether it was in park or some park neutral or some other forward or reverse gear. Oxygen sensor, it only has one. I mean, what could be wrong with that? Whatever's happening on bank one must be happening on bank two. At least that's the way GM thought. And of course, this thing never went into closed loop because it never ran long enough. And it's a non heated O2 sensor. Uh, knock retard, degrees of spark retard. So, PROM ID was the calibration information that was in the computer for this specific application. There was a PROM chart, this 5861 number would show up in a PROM chart to see if there was a update to correct any kind of drivability symptom that might be present. So not a lot of data available. Certainly don't have misfire counters by today's standards. And uh, there wasn't much in the line of bi-directional tests, functional tests. Field service mode was the same as jumpering A to, uh, A to B, I think those are the two pins. And causing the check engine light to flash. And then backup spark and fuel ran it off an internal uh, ROM chip in the computer and, and just that backup spark and fuel. Fixed uh, injector pulse and fixed spark advance. Um, not much available. Display codes, clear codes, data list, road test. Just see if there's any codes. No codes. So, we'll have a look at the distributor cap and, and uh, I'll show you those grounds that I mentioned. Well, there's the vehicle. It is in remarkably good looking condition for a 1992. And this has the uh, 5.7 liter throttle body. Here's the grounds that I mentioned on the thermostat housing. Look like they've been repaired at some time. Um, often they got damaged by somebody changing the thermostat. And I'm sure this has had at least one thermostat put in it in 400 and 490,000 kilometers. Still removing that stud would sometimes spin the bolt. But there's two grounds here. One's the O2 sensor ground and I think the other one's a computer ground they can cause problems and we're gonna have a look inside the distributor cap when we get there it's also here for a power steering hose which we're gonna change first so I cut off the uh, ground wires and soldered two ring terminals I relocated this bolt to the other side of the thermostat housing because the wires were just a little bit too short uh, rather than extending the wires and putting an extra joint in there uh, I sp sprayed some water on the spark plug wires and on the ignition coil. It looks like the ignition coil has been replaced back there. You can see it's a fairly recent coil. It's not leaking. I couldn't find any secondary leaks. I do see this uh, PCV grommet elbow is pretty swollen. So that, that wouldn't cause a, a misfire. In fact, that might cause it to idle a little high because it would allow vacuum a vacuum leak and vacuum leaks on these engines cause them to run fast not uh, slow. So I'm going to change the PCV hose or put a new elbow on there or something. Um, make sure the PCV is good. We're going to pull the distributor cap off and have a look inside see what the cap and rotor looks like and the uh, terminals on the pickup coil where it connects to the ignition control module. So there's the cap and rotor off, or the cap off anyways. The cap doesn't look too bad. There's a little bit of oxidation on the terminals. I don't see any carbon tracking in there. This distributor's obviously been replaced. There's no way it would be have survived this long. No play in the distributor shaft. Gear feel, feels relatively good. But we're going to take the ignition module out and clean the base of the module and check those pickup coil connections on the module. They're down underneath here. So we'll take a look at it when we get So there's the underside of the module and this is the pickup connections I was talking about. These ones look relatively clean. As I said, this distributor has been replaced. So we're going to clean up the base of this module with some uh, sandpaper. 
and put a fresh coat of dielectric grease on it. Also clean up the base of the distributor where the module mounts and grounds. And remove these terminals and clean them and put dielectric grease on them. Otherwise it doesn't look bad. So I got the distributor all back together, module all cleaned. Uh, I didn't see anything significantly wrong in there, but sometimes the oxidation on the uh, pickup coil terminals is microscopic, you can't see it. I decided I'm going to use the uh, Vantage uh, here to have a look at the ignition patterns. So basically I went into the lab scope and ignition, then you have to go into setup, and down here into setup, and ignition again, and then pick the type of ignition we're dealing with. So it's a standard distributor ignition and you must pick the correct firing order. 18436572 is the correct one. If it wasn't correct, you'd have to select it. And eight cylinders. The number one trigger is going to be on number one spark plug. Uh, connect channel one trigger to cylinder number one. So I've got two test leads I'm going to hook up and I'll show you that in a second. And then we'll have a look at the ignition waveforms. I'm curious as to whether or not we could have a bad ignition coil. I did have that in one of these vehicles earlier, or in the past, and it caused a drivability problem only during warm-up. Once it was warm, it was fine. Well, we'll have a look. So the inductive pickup goes on the coil wire, and the trigger goes on number one spark plug wire. And we're going to set up and have a look at the waveforms here. So here's the superimposed pattern. And all the cylinders are laid on top of each other at 5 milliseconds. Here is a raster pattern at 5 milliseconds where all the cylinders are stacked. On some old scope it was called raster and later they called it stacked. What you're looking for is that they're all consistent. And a parade pattern allows you to compare peak firing voltages and it's averaging about 10,500 volts across and they look relatively normal. This pattern is good for comparing peak firing voltages but not for burn voltage and burn time. Let's have a look at a single cylinder here. Single cylinder. Now what I notice about this pattern is right in here, this is the peak firing voltage this is the burn time, burn voltage. Then we should have coil oscillations. Right here we should typically have at least four oscillations. I only see about three, two to three oscillations there. That usually means a weak ignition coil. And also the burn time here is about 1.3 milliseconds. And usually it should be about one and a half or better. Let's rev it up and you'll see the well move back over into the start of the... That's the start of the well. I'm not completely pleased with this burn uh, or this uh, coil oscillation portion of the pattern. To me it looks a little lacking. I think I'd like to try another coil on it for what it would take. So I've got the uh, ignition set up in parade pattern right now and all the peak firing voltages is around 9 and nine to 10,000 volts. I'm going to short out spark plug number 2 or wire number 2 at the distributor cap with a grounded pick and that's, uh, sorry, that's number 8. So that'll be, that should be this cylinder. What we should see is this peak firing voltage should drop down and the burn time should get longer. So I'm going to do it right now. So it's, short, it's shorted out now so the burn voltage has gotten short, lower and the burn time has gotten longer. It's more effective if you see it in the uh, superimposed or parade pattern, I'm sorry, in uh, single cylinder mode. So if I go into cylinder 5 milliseconds, I have to pick the trigger here now to get, uh, to get the different cylinders. 
So that's cylinder four, five, six, seven, eight. So what you should see is this peak firing voltage should drop and the burn time should increase. Okay, there we go. Notice how the burn time increased significantly. And now I've taken it back to normal again. Just to show you what I'm doing, here's the, I've got a pick sliding up the boot like that to short out the sparkle wire. That's how we used to do the cutout test manually. And believe me, that doesn't lie to you. So we're waiting for the new coil to see if this uh, coil oscillations will improve. So there's the replacement coil, a DR37 from Blue Streak. Now, it's been replaced before, so the rivets are drilled out of the brackets, but I'm not even going to actually bolt it in. I'm just going to plug it in and uh, hook up the coil wire. It does not have to be grounded in order to work, and we're going to see if that improves the secondary ignition, and of course if it does, then we'll install it for good. So here is it running with the new coil, and we've got about a little bit better than, uh, than we had before as far as the uh, burn time is concerned, and we've got four distinct coil oscillations, one, two, three, four, that's on cylinder six, there's five, four, three, two, so it did improve the burn time by about 0.2 milliseconds. I'm going to save this recording and we'll have a look at, uh, well, I'll mount the coil up permanently, but I think it did improve. The reason why it affects it is a shorter burn time results in less, uh, less clean combustion and it's affected more when it's cold. Of course, ultimately we'll have to see how it starts tomorrow morning. So we're also going to check the base timing on this thing, which is supposed to be zero. According to this, we used to set it about two degrees advanced. But to do that, you have to remove this T-shaped cover and disconnect this set timing plug back here. And put it in the base timing. And that will set a fault code for the electronic spark timing circuit. There we go, that's disconnected. That's the set timing connector, or electronic spark timing connector. And we'll check the timing now with the timing light. I'm not going to be able to see this down here. Let's reset. I'm going to have to mark the timing pointer. So here's a before and after comparison of those two ignition coil waveforms on the same cylinder. The one on the left here is running just over 1.2 milliseconds burn time and then the coil oscillations you can see 1, 2, 3. The one on the right here is approaching 1.5 milliseconds consistently and they have a couple more coil oscillation so I think that's going to improve the startability we'll see in the morning uh, what it's like you can see the uh, coil on time or the burn time is longer and that will help ignite a rich cold air fuel mixture much easier but we'll see what happens tomorrow morning so I'm about to start this engine cool uh, it's been sitting all night, but it's fairly nice outside today, so we'll see how it starts and runs. Well, that's pretty smooth. No misfires this morning. I took it for a road test yesterday. Seems to be okay. So we'll call this one fixed. Thanks for watching.